Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Hi, and welcome to Tangent Calling, the podcast where we go off on weekly tangents, mostly based on the books we publish. We cover pretty much everything from music to street art to literature to cinema to local ghosts and witches to foraging for mildly psychedelic tea. My name is Sol and today I'm joined by Richard and author slash journalist extraordinaire Jane Duffus. We are going to be talking to her about her new project which focuses on documenting the history of the legendary and enigmatic Sarah Records indie label, one of the most renowned and elusive indie pop labels of all time. And she's also going to be taking us through a list of five ordinary women from history who did magnificent things and who deserve to be remembered. As always, we have a discount code for this week. Head over to the Tangent website, grab yourself some copies of Jane's books, which are available on the website. We've got The Women Who Built Bristol, Volume 1 and 2. It's an absolutely brilliant read. It makes a brilliant Christmas present. So pop over now and use the discount code Jane to grab yourself a copy. Also, please like and subscribe. It really helps us out. I think we've got over 30 subscribers now. So if we can see if we could get 35 likes on this video, I'd be super happy it really get me in the Christmas spirit. Uh, and, you know, if we can get some more subscribers in there, then that would be absolutely fantastic too. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Richard. So our guest today is Jane, Jane Duffus, who, um, who I've worked with over a number of years on various projects. Jane is a hugely accomplished journalist, editor, author, promoter of women's comedy nights, and... Um, and welcome, Jane. Welcome to Hello. Tangent Calling. And Jane, we're about to embark on a new project. Uh, a, 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 a history, or a, is it a history? You tell us what it's about. It's Sarah Records, the definitive book about Sarah Records, a, a subject very close to your heart. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I go back to Sarah Records, just as a very brief nutshell for anyone who doesn't know, was an independent record label that ran in Bristol from 1987 to 1995. They, it was run by two people, Matt and Claire, who were both quite uh, cantankerous and set themselves up against the London mainstream music industry. And they deliberately positioned themselves in Bristol. They didn't want to be in London. They didn't want to put out 12 inches and CD singles and all that kind of stuff. They just put out classic seven inch singles, but they very, very quickly gained this cult following. John Peel championed them right from the very first record. And they got this huge cult following all around the world. And it just became an absolute phenomenon. And, it, and there was this whole subculture all around it. People would buy records just because they were on Sarah. They hadn't necessarily heard them. They didn't necessarily like them. They just wanted the, the complete set. And it's absolutely fascinating. I was a teenager at the time. I remember buying lots of these records, engaging in like pen pal correspondence with Matt, which was just so thrilling as a 15 year old in Somerset to be able to get handwritten letters from this guy who ran a record label. It just seemed so extraordinary and grown up. And it's so I want to write a book that really sums up that DIY culture and ethos at a time just before the internet happened, just before mobile technology, where people who lived in tiny little villages all around the place could make stuff happen, could get their favorite band to come and do a gig at their local pub and could put stuff on. And it was really empowering. And obviously you can do that now in a different way uh, via blogs and via social media and all that kind of stuff. And you can still do that kind of thing, but it's different. It's really different. And so I want to kind of I want to kind of really explore that and really celebrate Bristol as being a central part of that. And so, um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. That's the next big book. Did you know, do you know about Sarah, Sarah Records, Sol? Are they, they made any impact on you or is it all this is all new to you? No, yeah, I'm quite a fan of Sarah Records, actually. And um, what was it that initially attracted you to the label uh, back in the day? Was it the music, the bands on there or was it their ethos, their politics? <laughs> I think it was the romanticism of it. I was about 14, I think, when I first discovered Sarah Records via my older brother, who was about five years older, and he had a really, really cool record collection. He had loads, he didn't listen, he listened to proper 
he listened to indie music when it was independent music rather than indie then kind of around 1990 kind of meant that a major label had an offshoot label that they called indie but wasn't really and they'd stick blur or something on it and pretend that that was it that's not indie music this was proper independent music this was proper people not proper people they were all proper people they were all humans but this was people just literally uh, cobbling together 200 quid from their saturday job to get you know couple of hundred flexis printed up and then posted out to 50p to anyone who wanted them you know real grassroots independent music and he had and there was this whole network of it and so via my oldest older brother adam i he was just about to go i actually found my diary entries i was a meticulous and quite dull diary keeper as a teenager but i did chronicle absolutely everything that happened which you can kind of pick and choose the interesting bits and i found the actual entry from the day that I first heard my first Sarah record which is quite interesting <laughs> oh, from this wow. point of what view. song was that it was a heavenly record well first of all it was Tallulah Gosh who weren't they were on a different label they were on a Scottish label but Tallulah Gosh disbanded and then reformed with almost exactly the same lineup as heavenly which became a Sarah records band and he my brother Adam was just about to go away for a couple of months somewhere and he lent me a chunk of his records including a Tallulah Gosh one and he said I think you'll really like this give it a listen and I did and I loved it and <clears> I, but then he wasn't there to ask any more questions to I couldn't go on Google to see who because it didn't exist you know who's Tallulah Gosh what else have they done blah 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 and so by going into his room and rifling through this enormous record collection oops, I um, kind of found these Sarah records by, that had the same person, Amelia Fletcher, on the back. And I was thinking, ah, oh, okay, that can't be a coincidence. And then that was on, that was on, um, that was his Heavenly record. And that was on Sarah records. And they were quite distinctive, these seven inches. They were quite distinctive in design. They had these nice little inserts, quite fanzine cut and paste inserts that were put in there. And so then I started rifling through and found all these other records by bands called things like Even As We Speak and Another Sunny Day and all these other bands. And I just got really swept up with the romanticism of it. And uh, yeah, got completely uh, just absorbed right from day one. And what do you think about the music on Sarah Records? How would you describe it? And also, do you think it's distinct from other more popular uh, indie labels at the time like Creation? And it was completely different to Creation. I mean, Creation was quite guitar driven in a conventional manner and wanted to be a proper mainstream label. You know, I mean, they had Oasis, they had Teenage Fan Club, they had, you know, bands like that. I don't think, I think the music press kind of grouped Sarah bands together and said, oh, it's just another Sarah records. Oh, it's just another jingly jangly record with a twee girl on the vocals. Actually, there was no Sarah record that had a woman as the vocalist until Sarah's 30. So to, to, for the music press to dismiss them as just another girl-fronted label was uh, just factually incorrect. But there was, but listening to, I watched like yesterday, for instance, there was a documentary that came out called My Secret World about Sarah Records. And I watched it again yesterday. And it's really just seeing it all encapsulated in an hour and a half really does hammer home that there was no definitive Sarah sound. Like lots of the bands like Action Painting, for instance, were quite loud and quite like, quite, you know, just effervescent. And then you had like a traditional pop band, like Even As We Speak, who just did proper like Frente style Australian pop. And then you would have like acoustic Irish like folk from someone like the Harvest Ministers, there was no definitive Sarah sound. There was no, like all the bands sounded different to each other. So although the music press liked to lump them all together as jingly jangly fey women's <coughs> cap, there were actually very few women on the label, which for me is obviously quite troubling. And uh, as someone trying to research this book, I've got this long list at the moment of people to interview and there's very few women currently on there. But I was talking to Mary Wire last night by email who was the singer in Even As We Speak. And I was talking about this problem because she had had a look at my website to see who is this person who's got in touch and wants to interview me, which is perfectly reasonable of her to do. And she said, oh, I can see you're really passionate about women's stories and sharing stuff like that. That is gonna be a problem writing this book. But she said, you know, I suggest you talk to, and listed a whole bunch of women, which is really helpful. But she said, yeah, there weren't that many women involved. And so that's gonna be a challenge for me in terms of uh, balancing out this book. And it is something I am going to find a way of addressing. That's amazing, but actually, because I mean, the, 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 um, the stereotype you just described of, of Sarah Records is one which I absolutely recognise. It's been sort of fairly effete, jangly, um, 
indie pop with with lots of lots of girls lots of girl vocalists or women vocalists so yeah but that's that's the thing isn't it that's because that's what nme and melody maker just derided them at like even like um alexis petridis and everett true who were interviewed on who are journalists from the nme and melody maker in the olden days and they were interviewed on this documentary last night and i'm only saying this because it's fresh in my mind from watching it and they were saying, and they were both fans of the label, but there were plenty of journalists at these papers who really hated it. And they just said, you know, we got so much stuff through. We just didn't have time to listen to it. So if we, if we didn't like Sarah Records, we knew we hadn't liked other stuff on there. We didn't bother to listen to it. We just wrote a three word review like we did, like they did for The Secret Shine and just said, this is cancer. This is musical cancer. It's just like, wow. But that backfired because John Peel then read this review and was going, wow, any record that inspires such a response has got to be worth playing and then played it on his show. So, you know, and then made it re record of the week on his show. So it kind of backfired for that one. Oh, it sounds but actually a great book, Jane. I'm really looking forward to working with you on this. And uh, and one of the one of the reasons we're, we're talking about this now is that uh, we'd like people to get in touch. Um, people who've got stories or are big uh, Sarah Record fans and souls. I, I, I add more questions for Sarah Records. Just oh, go on then. Just a couple more. <laughs> I wanted to ask, who's your favourite band on Sarah Records? Oh, God. I'm going to have to say Heavenly because Amelia Fletcher is just, she's a bit of a girl crush. I mean, there's, this kind of goes back quite a long way. I mean, they were my gateway drug into Sarah Records. And I'm, I'm kind of stuck with Amelia and various band members through different incarnations, different bands that they've been in over the years. Uh, they were the first ever gig that I put on or helped put on as a 16 year old when I lived down in Yeovil and with a guy called Simon Barber, who used to be in a band called the Chesterfields that was signed to Subway Organisation in Bristol, which was a, a label kind of around the same time as Sarah in the 80s. And they were kind of, they were a proper jingly jangly pop band. And, um, and I knew him, he lived down there. I used to work at an independent record shop at the time. And I, so I knew Simon through there and he was kind of, he knew like Matt and Claire from the label and he knew Amelia Fletcher from Heavenly. And, I, and he used to put gigs on, you know, at local pubs in Yeovil and Sherbourne and stuff. And I said, I really, really, cause I'd never been to, to, to Bristol cause it was terrifying at the idea of being 15 and 16 and coming all the way up to Bristol to go to a gig. I was much too terrified to do that on my own. I was very shy and nervous and kind of like oh, lacking in confidence. So he was like, oh, okay. And I kind of pretend that I co-organized this, but I really didn't. Simon did everything and Matt and Claire did everything. And they very generously uh, pretended that I had helped co-organize this and gave me a free ticket and bought me a drink. <laughs> and um, Simon picked me up and took me home again afterwards. But it was so much fun. And so to me, as someone who then, like Rich mentioned earlier, um, did what the Frock, the Women's Comedy Club, and so, which was proper event organization. I kind of feel as 16 doing that gig at the Quicksilver Mail in Yeovil. That was my gateway drug into um, putting on an event and thinking this could be fun and you could make something happen. It's like it's a 16 year old in this sleepy little town in Somerset and you could think, I really want to go and see this band, but I can't drive because I'm not old enough and I can't really go all the way up to Bristol on my own because I don't feel brave enough to do this. And so let's make this band come to me instead. And it was fantastic. That was really, that was really empowering as a 16 year old. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I think there needs to be more stuff like that today, to be honest. But I'll check out Heavenly. I don't know them. What, what's but the they're album? now in a band called Amelia and her partner Rob are now in a band called the Catenary Wires. And um, and I've seen them quite a few times. They're very, very good. And they played at the Thunderbolt last year, back in the in the before times when people were allowed to come and congregate in uh, in small spaces. And it was such a nice event. And I was chatting to Amelia afterwards. And they were just so warm and friendly. Like, Amelia is now... Professor Amelia Fletcher, CBE, you know, she's like head of economics for the government or something. She's a proper grown up wow. person with a serious day job. But as a hobby or in her spare time, she and her partner just still play in these nice guitar pop bands. And I just think that's such an interesting person. I think my favorite uh, Sarah Records band would probably be The Wake. OK. Um, I think... Uh... I like the album Here Comes Everybody so much. Yeah. I don't know if they released that on Sarah Records. I can't remember, I'd have to double check. But no, they they were an amazing find for Sarah Records because they came from Factory, didn't they? And then uh, and then Sarah Records, some why they left Factory for Sarah is baffling because Factory was the far cooler 
and more superior label, but they knew best. So I, I'm trying to, there's a story to find out what happened there. But um, yeah, I no, know. I agree. The there, there, was, is... there was quite a few other Glasgow bands that seemed to end up on Sarah as well. So maybe they were all just... Well, there's a big connection between, um, which I go into in the book, between kind of the post-punk scene in Glasgow in the early 80s, like with postcard records and fast product and all that kind of stuff, and how that evolved into labels and enabled labels like Sarah Records. And so the Orchids, who were a really big band on Sarah, came from Glasgow, and there were a couple of others as well. So there's definitely, a, Glasgow is really, really important as a centre in this scene in the early 80s before Bristol obviously became the nucleus for all this in the mid to late 80s. But Glasgow is, is a really key city. It's That's nice to talk about I Sarah because yeah. I normally just talk about old dead women all the time. Well, I was going to it's say, this old dead women, this is your specialist subject, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, which is lovely, but uh, it's nice to talk about something different. I'm happy before. to talk about my old dead women. Old dead women, yes. And you've written about how many of them now? Yeah. Two volumes? How many women? Well, there are 250 old dead women in each book, different old dead women. But there are, if you, as I once did, <laughs> it took me all afternoon, went through them and made a list of all the women who are, because there's two and there's 500 women in total who have a potted biography across the two books. But then all the other women who kind of get a casual mention, don't have their own entry, but they get a casual mention, there's nearly 900. And I've got, uh, for volume three, I've almost got a list of 250. I mean, it'll keep changing. There's new women who come through all the time and people getting in touch and suggesting new, and I'm always open to hearing about new women because by this point, I'm kind of dependent on people saying, oh, you should hear about my granny's old school teacher. She did this. It's like, wow. And you'd never hear, hear about this person otherwise because they're quite hard to come by. So we, we published the first volume in 2018, didn't we? And then the second yeah. one in 2019. They've been tremendously successful. They're, they're, they're incredibly well written. They're, they're, they're great reference books. Um, why did you do them? What, what was, your, what was your, your, the drive? Because it's a huge task to, uh, to have researched and written these books. Why? There are a lot of... His, uh, Bristol is pretty well served for history books. We have... Uh, for some reason, more than many other cities, we seem to have a lot of history books. However, the vast, vast, vast majority of them have been written by men of a certain vintage who seem to largely write about people like themselves. So men of a certain vintage. And in doing so, they seem to completely forget to include any women, which was a really big oversight. And I found that quite annoying. So in much the same way as with What the Frock, which was the all-female comedy club I ran, I had no intention to be an events promoter. I was a journalist, had been a journalist for a long time. That's what I want to do. I like writing and researching. I have no interest in events, but all comedy in particular, <laughs> really. I know very little about comedy, despite uh, what happens. Um, but that came about because a friend and I, Kind of thought oh let's go and see some comedy we haven't been to see any comedy for a long time and so we looked through some listings for local comedy venues in bristol and although we weren't consciously looking for women to see and we weren't even thinking uh, about women and men and the lack of women in comedy or presented in comedy it just became blindingly obvious that there were no women being booked and i found that really annoying and um, I just kind of thought, well, if no one else is going to do this, I shall do it myself. And I teamed up with the Festival of Ideas and we put on the first event at the Arnold Feeney back in 2012. God, it's a long time ago. And it sold out really, really quickly, like the Arnold Feeney Theatre, I think it's 210, 220 seats. It sold out really, really quickly. Uh, the waiting list, we could have sold it out like numerous times over. And it was a huge success. It went down so well. Um, the third event ended up being booked before that first one had even happened. It snowballed, um, but that wasn't what you asked. <laughs> what you asked was why I did, why I wrote the books. And the reason I wrote the books was exactly the same as the reason I did the comedy clubs in that it annoyed me that all the existing history books and the museums as well seemed to have forgotten to mention any women. And I just kind of thought that just doesn't seem right. And there were, there were about three women who come up again and again in the history books and in the museum. So you get Annie Kenny represents all of the suffragettes and the suffragists, which is a big burden to put on her shoulders. She is but one, she's an impressive woman, but she is but one woman. 
but she she stood for all the suffragettes and suffragists and then you had Mary Carpenter who represented all of the reformers and the, the do-gooders that that was again that's everything she stood for all of them and then you had Hannah Moore who stood for all of the writers done that seemed to be it and I thought that doesn't seem right that seems so just, I guess the, I guess the message <laughs> is don't annoy Jane otherwise she'll write a book about you yeah pretty much <laughs> Just on, just on the side, I just see the gaps where women have been left out and it annoys me. And so I do something about it. Just as an aside, the reason there are so many history books in uh, Bristol is uh, Redcliffe Press. John, John yeah. and Angela Sanson at Redcliffe, who, uh, uh, who, are, who were uh, formidable publishers. Sadly, John passed away in 2019. And they published, I think at the last count, over four, more than 400 um, local books, not all local history, but many of them, um, and uh, magnificent publishers. And um, that's that's the sole reason why there are so many local history books. Well, it's not the sole reason. They do have a very impressive back catalogue. I quite agree. But I think what's my favourite, lo- apart from Tangent, my favourite local history publishers, uh, which no longer exists, but you can get their books really easily via the libraries or secondhand online, are Bristol Broadsides. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Who just, who yeah. were kind of like a community co-op writing group, as I understand it, kind of in the late 80s. Yeah, really 80s. interesting. They're really, they're, they're worth a book in their own right, actually, because and they did a story. Like yeah. proper people's history, working class history real people's history living history they were really good at doing oral histories with some really interesting people who whose stories didn't necessarily who weren't necessarily extraordinary people who wrote famous books or painted great masterpieces but they were really important and i'm very thankful to them for all the work that they've done you're, right, you're absolutely recordings. right Jane. It's, um, it's, they're often overlooked because they they you know they, they they achieved an incredible amount in a relatively short period in time then just seemed to crash and burn but they you know they made a huge contribution but I really urge anyone to seek out their books, like in a secondhand shop or in the, most of the library, Bristol libraries stock all the books kind of between them. And you can order the books from the libraries as well if they're not in your local ones. So I really urge people to, to check out those books. There's so many. So, Jane, you've um, you've done us a top five. You've I've done, done you a top five. In, in true chart. I've it down here in my we're, we're reader. Slowly, we're we're slowly just turning into like a top five. So yeah, we're, we're just five. a list, aren't we? Just because we're just a list. list after list. But what, so I mean, you've written directly about, about 500 women in the, um, in the two volumes. Um, obviously, very difficult to choose a top five. What, what, what's the criteria for these, these women? What, what, how would you group them together? What, what have they got in common or, or have they got nothing in common? These are my top five ordinary women. So as I said just now, I really want to celebrate ordinary women. So across the books, obviously, we've got some some obviously great women, women who founded schools, or women who invented the police force, women pilots, women, uh, women artists, writers, all those kind of obviously great women. And that's fine. I have nothing against those women. They're all very interesting. However, what really gets overlooked, and this goes back to what I was saying about Bristol Broadsides, is ordinary women. I really, really want to celebrate ordinary women because most of us are very ordinary people. I'm very ordinary. Uh, I'm, everyone I know is very ordinary. They might do very interesting things, but we're very ordinary people. We don't all have tons of money and a fancy education and a wealthy family to give us a foot start, a, yeah, lift up in life. So the people that I want to talk about are five very, very ordinary, but very interesting and impressive women who have largely been completely forgotten. The last one I'm going to talk to you about is my bete noir that people... Oh, don't about. give it away. Don't tell us who it is yet, because... I'm not going to tell you who she is, but oh. it really irks me that oh. she has not been remembered. So who's and at number five? It took five, me so right? long to find out about her. Who's who's at number five? Where are we starting? Well, they're not in any order because that's too tricky. They're just they're they're almost in alphabetical order, but they're just they're not in any order. They're just a random order of five impressive women. So who who are we going to start with? We're going to start with Matilda Bennett. Who... Oh yes, I remember her. Yes. Yeah, yes, good. Right, Matilda. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. She, she yeah, was... good old Matilda. So she was quite an unusual entry. She's in volume one, which is the pink book, and she's got an unusual entry in that she is a child. And I don't know a massive amount about her or what she went on to do afterwards. The reason I found her was she was born in around 1830, and she worked in a pottery 
in Bristol. And I think her story is really important because she is here to represent the gazillions of children who worked in factories. And there were so, so, so many of them. So kind of, we're kind of fortunate that we have this rare glimpse into the life of this pre-adolescent working class Bristol girl who worked full time. And the only reason that we have this record is because in the early Victorian period, there was a spate of going around and checking up on factories and someone had written a report on the working conditions in this factory that handpicked a number of girls to write about and Matilda happened to be one of them and if it wasn't for this report she would be completely lost completely forgotten and that's a travesty but she worked at this uh, pottery and I'm just going to read a very short extract from this report which sums up who she was so the report said, she is a painting girl at the Bristol Pottery. She has been so for about two years. She paints cups and saucers. She comes from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with a half hour break for breakfast and a one hour for dinner. She sits at her work and is employed there every day under Mr. Marsh, the foreman, who superintends, but he never beats her or treats her ill. She is paid as much as she earns and gets four shillings, six pence a week at most, sometimes two shillings, nine pence. She has her health very well and she likes her work and her treatment. I think what's so striking about that is that it's commented on that her foreman doesn't beat her or treat her ill as if that's a likelihood. And it was a likelihood. This is yeah, 1840, 1845. This is really shocking. It's not that long ago. Really, really shocking. She's about, she's 11 years old at this time and she's working a 12 hour day just so shocking so shocking we don't know what happened to Matilda in the rest of her life I found a report in the Western Daily Press in for 1906 of a woman named Matilda Matilda Bennett who was found dead near a railway line near the potteries so there's a possibility that could be her it could be a different Matilda Bennett I'm not 100% sure I mean the pottery connection does kind of link them together but it could be a coincidence. So I don't know what went on with Matilda after then, because someone like Matilda, she wouldn't be documented. Working class people traditionally weren't documented because unless they got into the newspapers, which generally they would only be in the newspapers if they'd been up in court, which would suggest they'd done wrong, or they'd been murdered or something awful had happened to them. If they just lived a quiet, calm life, going about their business without bothering anyone, you get forgotten. If you're not a, an educated middle-class person who can write and so you've written letters and diaries, which I'm sure Matilda didn't because I can't imagine how she would have had the time, um, and she probably wasn't literate, then these things aren't recorded and kept. And often people don't keep these things anyway, or they don't get passed down. So I think it's really important that we still have Matilda's story thanks to that report. That's a great choice, and uh, I think you're absolutely right that the, you know the the one one of the many great things about the the women who built Bristol in both volumes is is a is a snapshot you get into um, these women's lives and and also the 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 social demographics and the, and the society in which they they lived and um, and also where where you where you've got the resource chain I think that you 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 paint really good pictures of the women's character as well. Um, and, and even with Matilda, who we know very little about, you get a real kind of sense of connection with her, which is which is which is which is uh, wonderful. And um, you know, I, when I when I read that entry, I felt quite sad when there was a possibility she was knocked over by a tram, possibly by the the pottery factory. And you do and you do wonder what happened to uh, uh, to Matilda. So that's a great choice. And um, uh, who's at num who's who's next? I won't say number four, but no, uh, who's next? Who's We've next? got Gladys Ellis next. Oh, I don't and, remember her. Gladys, I'm oh, gonna... you will. You will. Gladys Ellis was a matron at the Children's Hospital. Ah, now, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Next week, uh, I think it's next week. What date are we on today? It might be the week after. Anyway, the 2nd of December will be 80 years since one of the big bomb blitzes in Bristol. And this kind of ties in with Gladys's story. So she was a matron at the Children's Hospital. And at the time that one of the bombs hit and it hit the hospital, she happened to be standing outside. And she spoke about this in 1995 to the evening press. And she was saying when the blast, when the blast hit, she sailed through the air and her flight was only stopped by her tin hat, which hit the front doors. But um, 
what Gladys did that night was just unbelievably brave and spoke so much about her devotion to the children that she was caring for at that hospital. So obviously the children's hospital had been bombed and they had to evacuate all those children immediately because anything could have happened to the building. So they took them to the homeopathic hospital up the hill at the top of St Michael's Hill. And this was going on despite the fact that bombs were still falling all around them. She and the other nurses were getting all the children, many of them but I don't know, would have had all kinds of illnesses, perhaps they couldn't walk, perhaps, you know, they had all kinds of uh, needs. And so they were having to get these children as quickly and as calmly as possible up the hill. So despite all that, they got, um, Gladys says, we got all 86 children up to the home homeopathic hospital. It was really difficult. You could see the bombs coming down. There were fires everywhere. And then we took a roll call and they realized that one child was missing. And someone was saying, I think we've made a mistake. I think we've made a mistake. We've missed one. And so Gladys went back to the hospital on her own and she hunted everywhere for this one missing child. Despite the fact that bombs were still falling, she was on her own, she would have been frightened. She went back into that hospital on her own and uh, they, hang on, what does she say here? She says, before I got to the front door, I heard pattering feet behind me and it was one of the fire watchers. We couldn't get even, we couldn't even get into the front door because there was a great big hole there and I fell into it. So after she climbs out of the hole, she goes back into the hospital, she goes up to the children's floor and she searches everywhere for this child. She can't find them, but she just has a gut feeling that they are there somewhere. And she goes into her office and hiding underneath the desk, wrapped up in her coat, is this little boy who's just become terrified and he's hidden and he's got missed somewhere. So she gathers him up and she takes him up to the homeopathic hospital. And I just think, what a brave, brave woman. She got an MBE for her for her efforts that night, which I think she really deserved. And she stayed working at the hospital for a long time. She later went on to work at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital in London. She became Lady Superintendent of the Red Cross and was eventually matron of the Bristol Children's Hospital later on. And what an impressive woman, what a brave woman. You know, there's a lot of stories of people who did very brave things during the war and by saying there's a lot of them, I don't in any mean, anyway mean to diminish those stories because it must have just been a horrific time that required a lot of bravery. But I think it's important that we don't forget any of them if we possibly can. And so I don't want Gladys's story to be forgotten among all the other ones, which are all equally important. But Gladys is the one that I'm talking about today. That's a, that's, that's a really great story, isn't it? And uh, it's if you kind of feel that these people should be more celebrated I mean, not just people you know just mm. ordinary people in general it doesn't happen does it as part of the no. curriculum uh, um it's a terrible shame and you know just again going off on a bit of a tangent it's, it's, it's similar to the, the bristol bus boycott story you know which was a an incredible story from the from 1963 which just is largely forgotten in bristol it's just not taught and i think uh, i do wonder if there if there is some scope for um uh, for these people to be recognize more in some sort of local curriculum because uh uh again you, you say it's, it's usually a male history isn't it at bristol which we which we focus on but you know gladys is um it's an amazing story and, and again you know the, the writing really brings that that story alive because it must have been such a difficult time and you know in that in that raid and other raids that the um bristol was um was essentially a firestorm wasn't it you know the the, the, the whole of the whole streets were incinerated it must have been absolutely terrifying but uh anyway who's next jane who's who's, who's, who's next? our next ordinary we have woman alice price next oh yes yes I'm remember that. alice I remember alice that. i found via a bristol broadsides book actually and if i'd know, alice is in volume one and if i'd known when i did volume one that there would be a volume two i would have held on to her and given her her own dedicated entry in volume two as it is she's kind of a footnote at the back of volume one which is extremely unfair but we shall give her her airspace now so alice price had, she's a little bit similar to matilda in that she was factory worker but also we know more about her and we have her story in her own words as well so that adds another another shape to things so she had a really awful start to life her mother had died when she was young and she lived with her elder sister and her father. Her father worked as a smelter and had been driven mad by lead poisoning. And this made him very violent and very aggressive to Alice and to her sister. He attempted su suicide numerous times and he also threatened to slash Alice's sister's throat. You know, he was obviously a troubled man. 
So um, Alice had a number of other siblings who died in infancy. She'd had a really, really tough start to life. So when we find her in 1911, she's just 13 years old. Um, she, her dad's taken her out of school. You know, we can't afford this anymore. She's got to go to work. So uh, he threatens to kill her in one of his rages. So age 13, her mother's just died at this point. She runs away from home. She has no money. She has nothing, absolutely nothing, except what she's wearing. She sleeps rough in some wash houses that back onto the feeder canal and she waits until Monday morning. So she sleeps out in these old wash houses for several days. She has nothing to eat and she has just the clothes that she's wearing. She waits until Monday morning and then she goes to the Great Western Cotton Factory and she asks for work. And she said, um, she says, to my great surprise, I was taken on mainly for the cheek, I think. And I was paid the princely sum of three shillings and sixpence. But the clothes I was wearing were my entire wardrobe until I could sneak back and get some more. I hadn't eaten since Saturday except the bread thrown out for the birds. Payday was a long way off and I was homeless. She spent that whole first week that she was working sleeping in that wash house. She ate leftover food that the other women from the loom kind of gave her out of sympathy because they knew about her story. And she drank tea that she could find at work to keep herself going. But when she finally got her first pay packet after that week, her father, who had got wind that she'd got this job, turned up outside the factory and demanded really violently and really aggressively that she give him all of her money. And understandably, she refused. And he became more and more violent, more and more aggressive. The older women at the factory who had got to know Alice a little bit during that week, they rallied around, they screamed and they shouted, and they basically fought him off her and scared him away. And then uh, she never saw her father again, which was probably a good thing. And one of the old women, one of the, so one of the older women who had kind of taken pity on her, invited Alice to live with her in her home and kind of took her in as one of her own children. And I just think that is an ex that was a woman called Mary Ann Fry. We should remember her name as well. So I think that is such an interesting story in terms of a young girl, again, little more than a hundred years ago, who at age 13 was homeless, was having to fend for herself, earn her own living. Her mother had died, so she had that to contend with. She also had to contend with the fact that her father um, had a lot of issues and you know, couldn't be a father to her. Plus she had to form a whole new family and everything else. I just think that is such an important thing to remember. So, And yeah. also, I guess, I guess the, 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 again, it highlights the um, the role of working women as well, you know, when working in, um, uh, in in industry, inner city industries, which uh, uh, I think is the stereotype maybe doesn't uh, doesn't record that fact that women played a really important part in the as, as a workforce in those times and continue to do so today, obviously. And the solidarity of women who gathered around and protected Alice from this person. They'd only known her for a week, but they recognised that you know she was someone that was on their side and they should protect and look after and they rallied around to support her and to protect her and I think that's a really important thing as well. So who's next Jane? Who's next is Ethel Hawkins who uh, is, I became quite fascinated with Ethel, I have been and found this property that is relevant which I'm so pleased this still exists. So um, I don't a hundred percent know that Ethel Hawkins is the correct name for this woman but by looking through the censuses and everything, my best bet is that the person I'm talking about is Ethel Hawkins. So uh, in the late 1890s, Rock Cottage, which you can still see is right at the end of West Street in Bedminster near the Parsons Street station end. It's still there. If you look up, there's a big wall and then you look up and there's a old white house and it says rock cottage very helpfully on it and it's uh, that's worth having a look at on its own it's quite interesting i think west street on its own is quite interesting but this at that time this was in the eight, 1890s this was a grand home for the bennett family john bennett had made his fortune as a mine owner and he had uh, he had a lot of money he had a wife and he had a lot of children so the story goes that his toddler son henry was causing a lot of noise and disturbance one afternoon. And Ethel, who was his nursemaid, she, she took him out into the garden so that he wouldn't disturb his elder, his elder siblings who were having their lessons. So she was sitting, there was an old well at the end of the garden 
And so she was sitting on the well with Henry on her knee. The wall crumbled beneath them and they both fell all the way down to the bottom. Now that on its own is pretty scary enough, but um, she wrapped herself all around this boy instantly, because I mean, it can't take that long to fall down a well, but she instinctively wrapped herself around this boy and in doing so, she prevented him from becoming impaled on a rusty pipe at the bottom of this well. Instead, Ethel became impaled on this rusty pipe. She must have been in absolute agony. And she was down there for over an hour before anyone heard her shouts for help. So for that hour, she wrapped herself around this boy. She kept him warm, she kept him safe, she kept him calm. And she had to pretend that she herself wasn't in awful, awful pain. So I think what a brave, brave woman. We've got a coda for this story, which is good and bad. So Ethel uh, went on to marry the family's gardener. So that's good. However, Henry, unfortunately, was called up to fight in World War I and was killed as a teenager, which is very sad. So, yeah, I think that's an interesting story about a woman's bravery. And again, that isn't something that would necessarily be remembered, but it should be. It should go down in folklore. You've got the story of... Hannah Twomey, who was the barmaid who was eaten alive by a tiger that <laughs> a travelling circus brought to the pub garden. And that story is remembered as folklore. You've got Princess Caribou that is remembered as folklore. But why isn't this remembered as folklore? It should be just in the same way. Where did you, how did you research that one? Where did you find out that was it was, was it a contemporary newspaper report or? No, that one I found. So there was, I can't remember without, I think it's a book called About Bedminster. I can't remember. Oh, I know that book. Yes. Is, oh, is, is that what it's called? It's a, a photo a, book. Yeah, it's an incredible of old, old photos book. and then captions underneath. And there was a caption that was just something. It was a, I think it was a photo of Rock House. I can't remember what that. I'd have to go and look at it to double check. But um, there was something in the caption that made me think, oh, there was a nurse who fell down a well or something and so you just find all these little snippets and then you go away and you kind of work out roughly when it was and you trawl through newspaper archives and you try and find things to piece it all together so that's what she's really, really worth uh, emphasizing is that jane's books are um they're, they're far more than a, than a procession through the you know the the, the well-known women of, of Bristol, there are so many of them but there's, there's really in-depth research and detective work and uh and, and also, I suspect this is something to do with your, your background as a journalist, Jane. That you've got that sense of curiosity, haven't you? You want to know more about these women. And I think this is a great example of that, where just a caption in a, in a, in a, in a photographic, historical photographic book of Bedminster was a spur which got you questioning and being curious about what happened. And that really comes through in the books. Well, thank you. And that would lead us very nicely to our next woman, our final woman in this whistle stop tour of five, who is Amelia Nutt, who is, she was such a challenge to find out about. I discovered her by accident one morning. I was, when the Gromits were here a couple of years ago, and my challenge was to, my self imposed challenge was to run around and get them all on foot. And there was one out at Chew Valley Lake, which was a real nuisance because out and back to Chew Valley Lake is 16 miles and involves going up and down a really big hill. And on my way there, I went through Withywood, which isn't an area I'm often in, and I passed the Amelia Nutt Health Centre on Queen's Road. And I thought, oh, okay, brilliant. I've uh, got something else out of this trip as well as my grommets. And so I thought, oh, Amelia Nutt must be somebody if they've named a health centre after her. Brilliant. So I rang them up the next morning, I explained very briefly who I was and what I was doing, and why I was interested. And I just thought I wondered who Amelia Nutt was. And the person who answered the phone said they had no idea. Now, that's not a reflection on the person who answered the phone. Um, they don't know. But it's awful that they don't know. It's awful that a building can be named after somebody and no one, no one there knows who that person is. Because if I worked in a building that was named after somebody, my first question would be, if I worked in the Wills Memorial Building, my first question would be, who's Wills? Why, why has he got a memorial building? You know, you would want this, it seems like a really obvious thing to know. But if no one there knows to tell you, then that just gets forgotten. And I really made it my business to find out who Amelia Nutt was. But it was so, so hard. It took me... I'd say six to eight months, obviously not constant because that would be crazy, but on and off of like digging around and trying to find things. 
And it took about six to eight months of finally getting a lead. And the lead I found was in a tiny little nib in one of the newspapers in the archives. But in a nutshell, she was, she lived from 1845 to 1919. And she was a family nurse to a family called the Jenkins who lived on St. John's Road in Clifton. And she worked for them for about 50 years. She must have come in initially to look after the children when they were very little. And then obviously the family became fond of her and she kept living with them as in a domestic capacity. And then when the older members of the family became ill, she nursed them. And so she lived with them for about 50 years. She obviously didn't have any family of her own. And when she died, they were obviously very, very fond of her and they wanted to remember her. And so they donated a sum of money in her name to set up a health centre, what with her having been a nurse. And that is the Withywood Health, the Amelia Nutt um, Health Clinic in Withywood. But that should not have been so difficult to find out. And there should be a little plaque or a little poster or something in the health center. And this isn't just an attack, this isn't an attack on anyone, but this isn't a criticism of the Amelia Nutt Health Center. This is true of so many. And what's even more shocking than this is the Grace Reed Study Center at the University of Bristol, where they only called it that in 2015. I walked past it in 2017, 2018, so only two or three years later. And I thought, brilliant, Grace Reeves, who's she? And finding out who she was, the University of Bristol's alumni office, press office, the Grace Reeves Study Centre itself, none of these places had any idea who Grace Reeves was, yet they had named their building after her only two or three years previously. And that really shocks me and, and depresses me and makes me really angry and again, it, this is, I, it was through no thanks to the university that I found out who she was. I eventually found out who she was through a really painstaking kind of going on Google, searching and searching, going kind of sideways and sideways and sideways, kind of getting a hint of a Grace Reeves around possibly an, an agree that kind of time and area. Maybe she's the Grace Reeves we want, maybe she's not. I did find a different Grace Reeves and kind of followed her for a while and then eventually realized ah, this can't be the one that I want. Anyway, I eventually found her via a retired geography professor at who had worked at Bristol Uni who had been involved in uh, when it was the 75th anniversary of the geography department and Grace Reeves who was still alive at this point, this was in the 1990s, and Grace Reeves in a nutshell was the one in the first ever year of geography students when the Bristol University had a geography department. And she went on to become a great geographer in her own right. She taught at uh, different universities and they were very helpful in giving information at Cheltenham and Gloucester universities, which merged, become St. Mary's. And they kind of found bits and pieces that she had donated. She luckily was a great collector of things. She never threw anything away. Um, but again, it made me so angry, especially like Amelia Nutt Health Centre, at least was called that a long time ago. But the Grace Reed Study Centre was called that two or three years ago. And for them not to know is just unforgivable. So, Jane, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, great, that's a great five women. And um, uh, just... You got six, actually. Oh, we, could, we get six. Yeah, we, got, we, got, we, got, we got a bonus woman. Um, was there any one thing which, which amazed you, surprised you? Um, astounded you in this research? Was there something, was there, was there anything which stands out in your memory as being a sort of wow, you know, sort of moment uh, when you were researching the women? A lot of things have surprised me, but in many different ways. But the overarching thing that has surprised me um, is that the exclusion of women from all aspects of history is much, much worse than I would have first thought. And it's not even traditional history in the sense of these books or traditional history books or museums even more recent history in terms of Sarah records you know that's what 30 years ago even the exclusion of women from records of them is just astonishing the number of people or records that you find not <laughs> records is an unfortunate word in that sense um uh, artifact documents that you find that refer to it as just a label run by Matt for instance, and it was equally run by Matt and Claire, or that referred to it as a label run by Matt Haynes and his girlfriend, unnamed. Or um, just even like with Fast Product, which was a label I mentioned earlier, one of the Scottish labels alongside Postcard, which was run equally by, oh God, his name's gone right out of my head. 
oh Bob, Bob somebody, and Hillary somebody, Bob and Hillary, and um, <laughs> I can't remember either of their surnames right now, Bob and Hillary ran it, and um, again it was just always credited as Bob's label, but Hillary was just like Matt and Claire, she was an equal part of it, and so even in much more recent history, women are still excluded and forgotten, and these there's no excuse for that because most of the people who remember those times are still with us and still alive, still talking about it. And it's unforgivable. So Jane, those are your ordinary women. You've, we've had, yep. um, um, you know, the, the, the book obviously covers artists, uh, political women, um, the suffragettes. In fact, the, the, um, uh, the book was first came out on the, the, um, the hundredth anniversary of, uh, of, of suffrage, didn't it? it was, well, it came out on the 100th anniversary of partial suffrage. Partial suffrage, yeah, yeah. We get the real anniversary in eight years' time, which is... Yeah, yeah. So these are all great women for various, you know, for, across a whole spectrum of, of abilities and, and, and class and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and disciplines. Are there any bad women? Who's the worst, who's the worst woman? Who's the worst woman? I suppose the worst woman... Uh, traditionally in Bristol narratives is Amelia Dyer, not to be confused. Oh, with, yes, I thought you not said to be confused that. with Amelia Nutt, um, <laughs> who sounded like a lovely lady. She was lady. bad, wasn't she? She had Amelia Dyer was a serial was. killer and she killed several hundred babies and infants in a sort of baby farming capacity. So in in sort of Victorian era late mid late victorian era if you were a woman who became pregnant out of marriage or you know you were a servant and you'd been raped and assaulted and by your employer most likely and become pregnant this was obviously a source of great shame or you just had too many children you couldn't afford another one but obviously people didn't know about contraception family planning and stuff in those days and so you just had to get rid of this baby and so you thought that this nice lady who was often referred to as mother um, would she promise to either take you in and you could stay there as like a sort of mother's home until you had the baby and then she would uh, for some obviously she would take money for this service so you would give her money and that amount of money would vary depending on your own circumstances you would give her clothes and stuff so and the theory was that she would then find a nice family to adopt that baby and bring it up and love it as their own in reality um, she would kill that baby and bury its bones or its body in the garden or throw them in the Avon and she would sell the clothes for money for herself and the money that you had given her in order to look after the baby or to look after yourself she would just keep for herself so she's traditionally uh, a pretty bad egg <laughs> in Bristol's story she moved around a lot she when police would get suspicious of her she was a very cunning woman she before this she had worked at the glenside mental hospital which wasn't called that then it was something like the lunatic asylum or some other equally troublesome name to us now and she worked there as a mental health nurse and that's quite interesting as well because that gave her an insight into how to behave and how to play the system a little bit and also how to abuse alcohol and medicines which she did both of she then when she left that work and became a baby farmer full time she and when she knew how to play the system so that when the police were closing in on her and getting suspicious she could act as if she was insane so that she would get locked up for a period of time in the mental asylum but she knew how to play it so that she was kept in but not treated too awfully by the staff there so she kind of knew how to balance that and I think that's very clever and very cunning yeah. and interesting on its own. But there have been a number of books and films about her. Yeah. What's she well, ever let's, caught? Let's start ending on a negative note. Is there, <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, okay, one more woman. Um, funniest woman. Is there, is there a funny woman? Oh, gosh. Frances Power Cobb was pretty funny. She's a ballsy, no-nonsense Dame, I love Frances Power Cobb. Her and she was born in Dublin, and her arrival in Bristol was when she was 15 years old, 
again, her mother had died. She'd had a good education. You know, she didn't have anything to worry about. But her mother had died when she was quite young. She had a string of older brothers and her father wasn't really that interested in having a daughter. He just wanted to marry her off. He was barking up the wrong tree. She was a lesbian. Um, but he just wanted to marry her off and get done with it. She wasn't interested in any of that. So when one of her older brothers came to Bristol to go to school in Clifton, she came with him for the trip and then was meant to make her own way in the world and her entry into Bristol was just before the Clifton suspension bridge had been built and at that point you had to travel in it in a, like a wicker basket and you were then winched across the gap where the Clifton suspension bridge now is and I think that on it I mean I find traveling across the Clifton suspension bridge terrifying enough and that is on a bridge that's been there for a substantial amount of time. So imagine, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would be like Jordan in I'm a Celebrity to Get Me Out of Here being sick at the top of a cliff at the thought of having to cross this thing. But imagine the terror of just getting in a basket and being winched across. But in her diary, she talks about what a great, what a great jape this was and how much fun it was. And I think that sets the tone for her character and also is a great introduction to her life in Bristol. She went on to work with Mary Carpenter briefly at the Red Lodge, but the story goes that she wanted uh, a kind of friendship from Mary Carpenter that Mary Carpenter did not feel able to offer in return. So that was the end of that friendship. And she became, she was extraordinary. She was a very early suffrage campaigner for women's votes. She was a massive animal rights campaigner. She did a lot of work. She founded one of the anti-vivisection charities which still exists today. She was on the chair of some national suffrage committees. She also she was a massive, massive um, dog lover, which really appeals to me. And this is a story that's a great regret to me that I only found this out after volume one had been published, otherwise we'd have put it in the book. But she had this dog who she'd rescued and she absolutely loved this dog. This dog was like her child. And the dog went missing for a few weeks and she was just beside herself with worry and sadness. And this was before you could go on Twitter and post a picture of your dog and go, help, no one's seen it. And the dog was eventually found at uh, what is now Battersea Dogs Home and it was that was a very very at a very early version of what is now Battersea Dogs Home and she miraculously I don't know how this happened they were able to reunite her with this missing dog and to show her gratitude she wrote this short story and it only takes about half an hour to read you can find it for free online and I urge anyone who has any interest in animals to read this story and she's imagining what the dog has been up to in the few weeks while it's been missing and all the proceeds from this book she donated to the dog's home because she was so thankful to them for taking in her dog and for reuniting her and it's absolutely heartbreaking this story it's so it her love for this dog really really shines through and it's it just shows another side to her as well and also in her diaries there's all these talks of her yomping over the downs in Bristol with her dog as she has these walk and talk marching meetings with other women who she's doing important things with but she can't ever sit still she's always marching from one place to another and she has to have these meetings on the move because she doesn't want to just sit still in a room she's got to go constantly and she's got the dog with her and that just speaks volumes to me I can identify with that so uh, Frances Power Cobb everyone just explore everything you can about Frances Power. I'm going to find that story I'm going to find it tonight I'm going to read it what about you yeah, Sol? it's really lovely really lovely story yeah and also, thank this was at a time when it was illegal to be a lesbian well it wasn't actually illegal because Queen Victoria just didn't think it was possible to be a lesbian so she didn't even see it as a problem but people women who were lesbians kind of kept it quiet because it was considered you know not not the done thing but Frances didn't care she did whatever she wanted and she was very public about it and I think good for her I think it's amazing what you've done, Jane. Uh, you know, these stories remind us that often the kindest, most courageous and most heroic people uh, who have also often undergone extreme hardship um, are the people who should be remembered and culturally ce celebrated. And more than not, they are forgotten uh, because they didn't make a ton of money. Um, I think it exposes a really ugly flaw in our society um and it makes me it's it's been making me think a lot about um how we think about celebrity and you know stories like this i think kind of can can reconfigure our um attitudes towards uh the cultural celebration of individuals and maybe what matters i don't know if you have any thoughts on that 
Well, I hope so. I used to work at OK Magazine, <laughs> which was a very random twist in my career many years ago. I spent about five years freelancing at OK for a long time, and which was fun in my 20s. But you would spend a lot of time focusing on people like Jordan and Kerry Katona and Peter Andre and people who'd been in soap operas and stuff who were treated as celebrities. And their every fart and new handbag was given a whole picture spread and written about in gushing, effusive terms. And that just seems nuts. These are people who are famous for nothing more than being in a, locked in a house on Channel 4 for two months or something, but and for having had a boob job. And that's what they're famous for, or they're famous for who they slept with. And that's nuts. They're not famous for having changed the world in any tiny way, shape or form. What do you think it is about our society that negates these kinds of ordinary people being remembered and celebrated regularly uh, in society? I don't know, actually, but now I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking that there are actually quite a lot of ordinary people who are celebrated, but it's kind of twisted. So if you look at something, I don't watch it, but I can't help but be aware of it. Something like The Only Way is Essex. So someone like Gemma Collins, who seems pretty irritating from what I can get of her however she seems like a pretty ordinary person who struck lucky I think even people like Jay Goody was someone who went into Big Brother she was a dental assistant and struck lucky and I think Gemma Collins falls into that same category she's now got like she's got BBC podcasts she's got ITV2 TV shows she must be worth a small fortune she's off on luxury holidays all over the place you know she seems to be having a great she doesn't seem very happy but she seems to be having on the surface what is a great life but her she doesn't come across as a happy person at all none of these people do but she's a very ordinary person and she's now treated as a celebrity so I suppose in a way we are celebrating ordinary people but the difference is someone like Gemma I'm not picking on her in particular she's just the one who's sprung to mind there's tons of these people um She's literally famous for absolutely nothing. She's famous for being famous. Whereas the people I was talking about earlier, they're not famous, but they did interesting things. They rescued children during the Blitz. They, uh, they were treasured family nurses. They were 11 year olds who worked full time and made pottery that people used and had in their houses, but are completely forgotten. And that's really hard to reconcile. So all of these people are ordinary. Gemma Collins is ordinary. Jay Goody is ordinary. All those people are ordinary. But some of them had the, the good fortune to get propelled onto TV and onto the front cover of OK Magazine. But it did feel weird. Like, why are we writing in OK Magazine? Why are we writing about this dental assistant who's just been on telly? Why, what's she got to do with anything? It's funny, isn't it? Because someone having a kind of disastrous personal life seems to be more exciting and consumable uh, in a kind of celebrity environment. But someone having a really great personal life and being a good friend and being a good parent and good partner in a relationship, uh, that doesn't really get recognised as something that's juicy or uh, worth you know, Worth consuming. aspiring to. No, exactly. But yeah, if you look at like celebrity magazines, they are like someone like Kerry Katona, who I think her greatest achievement, well, not her greatest achievement, but the thing that people most are obsessed with her life for is that it is an absolute car crash. And when you're having a really rubbish time yourself and you read a magazine article about someone like Kerry Katona, you go away and you think, well, I've had a bad day, but at least I'm not her. <laughs> you just think that's not right that's not how it should be someone should be helping this poor woman not propelling her into more and more disasters by keeping this machine going that perpetuates this cycle of people ripping her off and abusing her yet that's what we're all buying into with this culture so it's it's not so jane the, um <laughs> We're going to direct people to your website to buy the book. There's, it's not only a great Christmas present, or they're not only great Christmas presents, but they ideal for birthdays as well. In fact, or for anyone. And they're also anyone. not just for women. I get a lot of people saying, oh, no, I'll buy no, it for my not. wife. And I always think, well, that's nice, but why don't you buy it for yourself? Or why it's don't a, you buy it for your dad? It's, it's, a really, it's a really important um, uh, part of the, uh, the, 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 the canon of... Um, of work into Bristol's history, you know. It's, uh, I think anyone serious about uh, about 
researching or, or enjoying Bristol's history just absolutely has to have these books um, as, as part of their of their library. So thank you so much, Jane, for for writing them because they really are a really important contribution to our uh, to our city's um, culture and and history. And I'm sure that the Sarah Records book will be equally important as well. I'm really looking. Can't wait. To yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Well. You might have to wait a little while. <laughs> Give it a couple so, of years. So Sol's it's going to be my big magnus opus. Sol's going to tell people where to buy the books and how to get them. There's 10% off until the end of November. And if you live in Bristol, there's a strong chance I'll run around to your house and deliver it so you don't have to pay postage. Blimey. Yeah. Marvelous. That's tempting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sweaty woman turn up and post it through your door. <laughs> Right, I'm going to stop recording now, unless there's anything else. I don't think so. I think so. Okay, I'll stop recording, then we can just say our fond farewell.